Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Third Wheel. I'm your host, Saren. And I'm your other host, Hamish. And today we are joined by Katie Mitchell's nomination. I, I can't remember what episode Katie was, but it was, it was a while back. But we're joined by Lareb. How, how are you doing, Lareb? And would you like to, yeah, just introduce yourself? Hey, I'm Lareb. I'm good, thanks. I was nominated by Katie, yeah, my gal pal from university. I, I don't know, how, how do I introduce myself? This is so weird. I've only ever been really introduced myself at job interviews. So hi, I'm Lareb. <laughs> <laughs> How, how do you introduce yourself at a job interview? I'm passionate and diligent and I'll <laughs> get the job done. <laughs> no, I guess if I was to introduce myself to people know who I am. I'm Lareb Nassim. I'm a creative producer. And yeah, I just love to make stuff. And I love to talk. So I'm really excited to be here and to talk to you both. Okay, uh, that's that's good stuff for a podcast. That's that's good. <laughs> Katie, so how you you two went to the same uni? Yeah, so I met Katie at university. We both did contemporary media practice together. CMP, CMP. I don't know if she did that in the interview. I can't remember. I feel like she did. So I'm just saying it for her. But yeah, that was the kind of... I I wouldn't be surprised if she did. Yeah. um, (laughs) I'm not sure. That was the kind of chant amongst the whole of the like CMP crew that whenever we entered a space or we were in the like university bar and there was a big crowd of us, we would just start chanting. But yeah. I feel like I would have hated you guys, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a political chant as well. So I'm like... The thing is, is that there was another CMP as well at, at Westminster. I think they were commercial music production, but we were like, yeah, we're better. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't think we were hated by many. I, think... I reckon you were secretly hated. Like if you go into a bar yeah, and start probably. chanting. Yeah, that's... Probably. But we there was know. such a small like number of us, so I think that's why we just kind of made up for it with our obnoxiousness and loud, being loud. But yeah, I met Katie, I think it was um middle of first year. I can't remember exactly how, but Katie is like the most like jubbly, bubbly person. And she just came up to me and I think she just said, hi, I'm Katie. Or was I introduced to her through someone else? I can't remember. I just know that as soon as we became friends, we became inseparable and she's still like one of my closest friends. I talk to her all the time. Whenever she needs that and like needs help with stuff, I'm always like there. Whenever I need help with stuff, always there as well. But no, that's awesome. And like in a creative space as well. So you said you were, I can't remember what the actual title you said when you introduced yourself. So it was creative producer. I I don't think there's, um, that's even a thing, but. Made it up. (laughs) Yeah, I made it it up. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, it sounds good, to be honest. <laughs> Do you know what? There's so many crazy job titles and titles lately that I feel like half the time people do just make it up. Like the other day, I was scrolling through LinkedIn and some person had like the oddest job title. And I was just like, is that even a thing? What do you actually do? Like there's so many words for one title. <laughs> you just sound like a glorified assistant, to be honest. But hey, ho. If, do you if, remember what it was? It was something like social, executive, creative, planner, yeah, that's already, that's something like too that. Words. Yeah, I was just like, I don't, I don't really understand. But if it floats your boat, then by all means, like for a lot of people, I guess the title is really important. I don't you know. know the I, yeah, exactly. The buzzwords all in the social, executive. What was the other one? I forgot. Like, there creative. Like five in there, but yeah. Yeah, the summing. But yeah, I I, just, I don't know. When I was in university, before like university and stuff, I very much had it in my head that I wanted to be a producer. But then when I got to uni, I realized I really liked making stuff as well, like making art and making content. So just along the days and throughout like me kind of finding myself and figuring out what I wanted to do, I was just like, I want to be creative too. So I'm going to call myself a creative producer. I don't have a boss, so you can't say no. <laughs> So yeah, growing up then, so you said you wanted to become like a producer before yeah. uni. What what exactly, when you say producer, I think of like a film producer. Mm. Is that the same, is that the right yeah. kind of thing or different? That's exactly it. If we're going to start from like the beginning of the beginning, I went to a sixth form college and I failed all my A-levels and I had to have that really difficult conversation with my parents, particularly my mum, and kind of break it down to her and tell her, mum. I'm never going to be a doctor. I'm not going to be a lawyer. <laughs> and I'm, like legit failed them all. Yeah, all legit like, failed them all. Like use, you, you like use, a- use across the board. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I passed only one, which was media. And that was because I like literally fought to do media am- amongst health and what was it? Health and social care, sociology, IT and media. So those were the four A levels I did. And I failed them all but media. So that was when I then spoke to my parents and I was just like, yeah, I'm not going to go down like the smart field. (laughs) (laughs) Did you just like find them hard or did you just like wasn't interested? I don't know what it was because I planned everything out and I had like notes everywhere, like on light switches and I revised like crazy. But I don't don't know. It just, I just didn't pass. I I don't really know how to explain it I've never really been good at exams as well I guess god knows how I passed maths like I don't know how I passed GCSEs (laughs) like nowadays I've heard GCSEs have become so difficult now which I'm kind of like really yeah from my sister my younger sister she has been like revising for her GCSEs as well and I like just look over her and the only thing I liked about maths is algebra I don't know why but that just seemed to have clicked with me. And it was the one thing that I was really good at, like solving and stuff. So when I like overlooked, over, like, looked over her shoulder and was like looking at what she re- was revising and stuff, I was just kind of like, what is this? <laughs> but yeah, um, I digress. I, f- I failed them. And then I sat with my parents and I told them and my mom was just like, okay, so what are you going to do? Do you have a plan? And I was like, of course I have a plan. And ended up finding a another college that was like an hour, 30, 40 minutes actually away from the house, um, a lot further out that had a really great media and film VTech and then a really good film A-level course. So I explained to her all. And then what was that? I explained to her it all. I explained it all to her. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Like, I don't think me or Hamish will like. Yeah, we're not going to correct you any, any English. It's fine. And then, um, yeah. How, but how did your like family take that? Yeah, my my mum really was not on board at all. She was just like, I mean, I guess the number one thing that is always said, even in, like Bollywood movies, is like, "Lo kya kahenge?" Like, what will people say? <laughs> and you have to think about how it looks on all of us and like all that kind of stuff and then also my favorite thing that my mum used to always say is always like this isn't really a job that our girls like ours do and that was really annoying mm. because it was like well can you not instead just kind of support me and be like yeah this isn't really what the girls like us do but if it's what you want to do then I'm going to support you and go for it and that's kind of what I wanted from my mum but I, I can't blame her either because she's never known anything else but academia and um, science and maths and all that kind of stuff. So it was, at that time, it was really difficult to kind of explain to her that um, I'm I'm smart in a different way. So it was really, uh, yeah, around college time, it was quite difficult to kind of fight for the fact that I wanted to be creative, but then also kind of having to always convince them that what I'm doing is is good like my dad on the other hand it, he took some convincing but as soon as he like realized that I loved it and it made me really happy he was just like go then don't and and make us proud like go for it don't don't give up basically if you start it don't finish um don't give up like halfway you have to really go for it and I was like cool that's all I needed and then after that I was just kind of like ran with it and um I had the most amazing film teacher at college who has become honestly another close friend of mine who I owe everything to him because he obviously knew that was really difficult for me to kind of convince my parents to let me do media in the first place and during my time at college the BFI the British Film Institute they basically were doing a short film kind of course where kids could come in and hover and make their own short films and I remember being told about it and I was just like no nah, I'd never get it but my teacher Barrington he was just like yeah you should do it you should definitely apply and I was like okay I'm, I'll apply but I don't think I'm gonna get it which is why I didn't tell my parents about it when I did apply and then I applied for it and then I ended up getting it and then I was just like ah oh, <laughs> I need your help and then he was just like what do you mean that I told him I got in and he was like, well, this is fantastic. This is like such great news, blah, blah, blah. Everything you dream, you like, your parent would say to you. 
And I was just like, yeah, but how do I now convince my parents? And then he was just kind of like, leave it to me. Don't worry about it. And I was just like, what do you mean? And then he basically gave them a call and he invited them in to, to come in the week after and just sat them down. And he was just kind of like, listen, Loreb is really going to thrive if he does this course. And she has like talent and she has like this energy in her that she needs to kind of grow it because I really think that she can go far. Well, well basically he just, I don't, I don't even, I can't even explain in words what it is he did for me. But if he hadn't have done that, I wouldn't have been able to have figured out that I wanted to be a producer because the BFI doing that nine week short film course, that was where I really saw the ins and outs of making a movie and working on like a production and creating a movie as well. And that was kind of like where my eyes really got opened up to it isn't just being a cinematographer or being a director. There's so much more to making a movie. I honestly owe it all to him. I was, I was going to say the bit where you like quoted some Hindi or some Urdu. Yeah, Aaron would look, look <laughs> at the bottom of his screen for some subtitles but couldn't find it. So he's like, shit. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I thought to translate it as well. Yeah, I, I was glad you did. Has, has your like mum changed her kind of perception well, of it now? I want to say yes, but I think at the same time she's still confused by it all. But she's a lot. She's a lot more hmm. um, willing to kind of hear me out. Like even today when I was telling her, "Oh, mum, I have an interview today, and she and uh, like it's going to be really fun." And she was an like, interview on a weekend. I was like, no, not a job interview. <laughs> and then I explained to her what a podcast is and you guys and all of the stuff that you guys do. And she was just like, oh, that sounds fun. I'm like, yeah, I'm excited. And then so it's like back in the day, if I'd mentioned something like that, she'd be like, oh, no, 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 you don't need to do that. What's the point about what? But now it's just very much if I tell her about something, then she'll take the time to kind of learn hmm. about it and what it is. Like even nowadays, because I'm currently unemployed, she keeps on sending me jobs within like the job sector and like media industry, which I find really cute and I love the for. <laughs> so like producing then. So if say say I was like five years old, yeah, and I came up to you and I was like, How do you make a film? Is that easy to explain? I don't know. Like say mm-hmm. say I wanted to make a film like myself just now, like no kind of I I don't know where to start. I've got a phone, like maybe I've got a camera or something. Like how would I kind of go about like obviously not like a big production but like maybe something to kind of yeah a short film to put on youtube the first thing i would do was figure out what it is that you want to make so what what is the kind of genre you want to go down are you making a mockumentary are you making a documentary are you making a drama or a comedy is it scripted is it non-scripted and then from there one of the key things i always do is just kind of brainstorm what your aims and goals are for making the movie and kind of what it is you want to sell and appeal to what what is your target audience it's kind of like making a product you can't just make a product you have to really think about Hmm. has this product been made before is it already out there is it already a thing does it already have like thousands of consumers and what is my usp unique selling point so it's all kind of thinking about Hmm. So for me, the first thing I always think about is what am I making? Why am I making it? And who is the target audience? Because like, even for me, I've been thinking a lot about the kind of content I want to make and the kind of um, shows and movies I want to work on. And it's just like, if it doesn't appeal to me and if it doesn't relate to me in a certain way, then I'm not interested. So then say, say I've got like my idea and my target purpose, my target market, whether... And then now I've got like, what do I need to find people? Say I've even like written a script. Like I, I know the storyline. Yeah. I know like kind of everything. Now is it like kind of finding actors, actresses? and? So that's usually about around the point where you would look for a producer. So you have your story and you have everything ready to kind of, I guess, start pitching to like Channel 4, Film 4, Netflix, uh, Prime, whatever. So you would, after you have everything ready, like your document, your Google Drive, whatever, ready to kind of start pitching and gathering a team, the first person you would kind of get on board is a producer because a producer is basically a black book of people. A producer will be the person that will introduce you 
to a director that they think would be work perfect with you and the story that you have in your mind and the story that you have on paper. And then that director would then work with the producer to kind of find the perfect cinematographer who's going to get those shots that you want. And um, yeah, it just goes on and on and on because a producer, will, that's like the best way to describe a producer. It's a black book of contacts and people within the industry. That's one of the key things that I had to learn during the BFI was that if you don't have the, as a producer specifically, is that if you can't network and you can't talk to people, there's no point. Because unfortunately, that is the way that this industry works. It's very much, you have to put yourself out there and you have to nag people and talk to them and pinch them. And Is it mostly kind of like freelance work or is it, would you find like producers actually working for like a specific company? Usually there's like production companies. So production companies will have two or three main executive producers who will do majority of the kind of hiring and main workload of a production and then you'll have producers and then you have PAs which are production assistants and then everyone after that so an executive producer is basically the person that has deals with all the money usually and where all the money goes and then a producer is very much also works with money but is more so trying to figure out all the nitty bits like assisting with casting assisting with um, getting the right crew on set and all that kind of stuff but it differs because sometimes production companies will bring in freelancers to kind of help um take off the what the huge load of work that they have because sometimes it's just easier to kind of spread it out across people who know what they're doing whereas sometimes other production companies who are like big because you have obviously you have indie production companies and then you have production companies that are in another like big company so like for example Havas for example has a, a, had their own in-house production company so the way that that would work is that when a movie or an advertising was being made instead of producing it within their own minor company they would go to HKX Productions to kind of produce it and then the producers within HKX would then sort out the budget figure out what it is exactly that the client wants and then you have to work within that budget that's been given to the producers and then obviously there are like budget cuts and all that kind of stuff but I can talk about that for hours yeah no it sounds it sounds like yeah super complicated to be honest probably a lot more complicated than what people mm-hmm. outside it's of the industry of probably like think or realize have you like worked on any kind of cool projects like whether it's at uni or yeah when i was in uni i worked on because the the cool the one thing that i love about cmp and just my degree is that they didn't want you to do the same thing over and over again so they really encouraged you stepping out of your comfort zone so for example at westminster the film degree you start if you start off as a producer then you have to be a producer for three years you can't like go and do a director or cinematographer, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas CMP was very much okay. one one year you'll be doing like photography and then three months will go past and now you're doing videography and then another three months goes past and you're editing. And then the second year you're like doing, I guess, sound editing. There was a specific word for it, but I can't remember it. And then there was also coding as well. So like it was like literally everything they forced us to do because they were very much about employers don't want someone who can only do one thing. They want you to be able to do everything and anything. I know you said you said like you kind of also you wanted to be a producer, but then you've kind of more just you want to create things. My favorite project that I've ever done, it wasn't film related, but I made a art installation piece with a friend, another friend of mine, Lucia, who... um is actually how me and Katie connected. So there was three of us at university where we were always together, Lucia, Katie and me. We did a installation piece in which we had to, we basically recreated a park bench scene, but made out of like, how many pieces of paper did we use? Like so much paper. So an installation is basically a piece of art. Actually, a better way to describe it is, have you ever been to the tape? Or the Saatchi Gallery. Tate Modern in South Bank. Yeah, Tate Modern in South Bank. Yeah, I have. Or the Saatchi Gallery, yeah. Did you say for Saatchi Gallery? 
Oh no. <laughs> yeah, I've been to Tate Modern. So have you ever went into a room and just seen a video yeah, yeah. playing on the screen? Yeah. And you're completely immersed and like that's all you can see. That's basically what an installation piece is. I wouldn't say I was immersed, I was just there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Here's like what's what the fuck's off with playing Avengers. <laughs> <laughs> it really depends because there are some that from the last time that I went to the tape. They had separated them into like two different walls. So it really depends on what the art piece is. But essentially, a, an installation is literally just an art piece that isn't a painting. I guess the industry term used for a sculpture or an art piece is an installation. I, I remember like at school, so I, I, did, I did art at A level um and did like gcc and all that so my class we always used to have like we had school trips quite a lot to these like museums and like art museums in london and i remember at the time like everyone just hated it it was like such a bore like traveling up and then all like we had to be quiet like inside of them and like go around and the teacher always asked us to like bring like paper and pens and like draw like one of them is we always hate them but i think it's something like yeah just at age yeah. now i'd be like yeah i wouldn't mind going to one and stuff like that it's just a lot of it's a lot cooler now, a lot trendier, I guess, than when, when I was younger. What about, I know you, you kind of mentioned earlier that you're unemployed at the moment. So like, what kind of work are you looking for? I was actually at Havas for a good year and a bit. And I was working for the internal um, production company. And I loved my job there. I was a team assistant. So it was kind of involved me being involved in everything from the beginning of the production to the end. But then COVID hit and I got made redundant. Then there was another job going within the within Havas. And then I started working for a different agency. I didn't enjoy it because it wasn't what I was doing before. And it was very, it wasn't creative at all. And it was just um, post-production based, which basically means that everything has already been made. So now all we're doing is like getting it sent to channels and getting it sent to the right people and companies. So I didn't enjoy it and uh, I was thinking about leaving for a while and but I don't know I just always thought about how dumb I would be to like leave a job in the middle of a pandemic and but then I lost someone who was like a similar age to me and it just kind of made me realize that I'm not happy and mentally this is really like messing with me so if I don't leave now I never will and um, yeah so then I left and my last day was actually last week Friday. So I've been on for a week. Oh, so recent. Yeah, it's been really recent. But now I'm basically looking for work within development for TV and film. So that basically means assisting scriptwriters and story makers in developing their plots and their characters a little bit further. So just being that kind of person in the room that's kind of making them think outside of the box and introducing characters that they wouldn't necessarily think of or introducing that characteristic to a character that they wouldn't think of. That's what I'm hoping to do. But it's really hard to get into that kind of industry because, like I said, you have to know people. And, yeah, everything is very, what's the word, nepotism. It's all nepotism. It's all, if you know someone, then you know someone. And if you're the father, sorry, if you're the child of a guy, then you get in. Or if you're a friend of someone. Yeah, it's like who you know, not what yeah, you know. Exactly. And if, if there are any, like, potential employers listening... Where, where can they like kind of find Yeah, you? so I'm on Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, at Lareb Media, L-A-R-E-B-M-E-D-I-A. And then on LinkedIn, I'm just Lareb Scene. I, I had this like, when we first started this, I don't know if I said it on like a podcast mm. or even said to Yomish, but I had this like kind of cool thing, like imagine if someone got like employed from our like podcast, I thought that'd be pretty cool. Can we get a referral? Like they listen to the podcast and they're like... <laughs> Fingers crossed. Oh, I don't know, I don't know. Uh, hey we'll if i it. get hired um, because of this podcast then i'm definitely taking you guys to yeah. eat <laughs> yeah, yeah if they if, if in an interview they're like oh we we heard you on the third wheel and it's like oh shit but yeah cool should we should we move on to uh something else yeah sure yeah so what else have you been up to recently recently or today 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 go today Hamish. Go today. <laughs> <laughs> today it was kind of like a slow day in the beginning but then i I had just literally before we started this interview, I just got in from donating some books to um, our local charity who are basically putting together a book donation kind of fun thing to the people in Palestine, in Gaza. Because basically, obviously, 
and that's even living under a rock. The kind of situation that's been going on in Palestine at the moment, the apartheid and the ethnic cleansing has been really um, overwhelming and crazy in which Israel doesn't care and they don't seem to care about the fact that there are human beings across the wall. And yeah, I think I'm going on a tangent. Let me just stop. <laughs> I'm getting angry. <laughs> Basically, the the situation in Palestine and Gaza isn't something that I think anyone shouldn't be speaking about because it's a humanitarian crisis. And these people and human beings who are being killed for no reason whatsoever other than the fact that they are Palestinians. And and it isn't just men, it's women, it's children. And they aren't all just Muslim either. They're, they're, they're made up of different religions and different colours and different... Yeah, the only thing then the only reason they are being killed is because they are Palestinian. And in the bombing, in the recent bombings and the recent attacks, there was a bookshop that was completely destroyed. And that was why today I had donated like half of my bookshelf to um, the bookshop in Gaza so that, so that they can just have some form of escapism. Like, I don't know how you can even escape whatever it is that they're going through and like the pain that they're going through. But, if there's any way we can help is just by talking about it and yeah I just thought books were always my sanctuary when I was younger whenever I need a distraction or something to focus on other than anything books were always there and this was like before the time where we had mobile phones or iPods or all that kind of stuff oh my god I sound so old book books are always there you know and books always help so when I found out that there was a local donation happening in which they were donating books so that he could rebuild his bookshop in Gaza I was just like what better way to donate books and to give it to people who need it yeah I I mean like yeah last I don't know how long it's been like last couple months really there's just been like so much kind of on social media like horrible footage and like posts you see kind of about like just the attacks over there and it's been going on for like 74 years now yeah, do you know, I was going to ask, like, do you know much about, like, the history and kind of origins? Yeah, I mean, I don't know much um, history. All I do know is that it's been going on for 74 years, and I don't think they plan on stopping anytime soon. But the one thing that the Palestinian people have said through social media, and I've just said in general, is that they need our help to kind of not allow the kind of media silence to carry on. Because I feel, because the one tool that the Palestinian people definitely have is social media. And the reason why the videos and the photos are so gruesome is because that is their reality. And that is what is happening to them. And it needs to be shared because it's not, it's not right. Like the UN has said on multiple occasions that Israel has, I don't know how many laws or how, how many times have like broken the humanitarian laws on how they're supposed to how you're supposed to treat another human being but they've broken like at least a hundred of them i guess again i don't know the statistics i'm just a human being that sees pain and sees suffering and just wants it to end like i just want it to stop i don't think anyone deserves to die based on the based on their gender based on their sexuality based on their religion there's yeah mind my french it's just bullshit we encourage encourage a <laughs> swearing on the show it's fine <laughs> well not encourage it but, but we allow it hold on <laughs> I, I was expecting you to scream i want the podcast so scream <laughs> that's a moment you're gonna create a moment <laughs> on your podcast Content. my aunt my father just walked in you want to say hi you can get a shout out who is it it's a podcast i'm doing for what? um the third wheel okay bye <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. We we keep we could like yeah. If you want to keep that in, or cut that out. You can if it too. helps to add to whatever. Then by all means. <laughs> it's quite funny. It's quite funny. I don't know if it kind of fit in with the topic, but like we will keep it. In. I was saying like how it's it's been going on for like yeah. I, f- I think the number you said yeah. was like seventy four years or yeah, hundred years, however long. But then how come like in the last like recently it's been kind of all over social media so much more. Usually during the month of Ramadan is when they tend to up the scale on attacks that they do. And this year, I I don't know. 
I, I personally feel like it ha- this happens every year in which the attacks start again in, during the month of Ramadan and then the awareness kind of starts building up again. But then like with any like activism and I don't, I really don't want to call it a trend, but some people do treat it as though it is a trend. And so it kind yeah, of yeah, yeah. It gets hyped up and then it dies out. Whereas with with the conflict in Palestine, because it's been going on for so long, it tends to get forgotten because ugh, I don't know how to describe it or to really um explain it. Like, but the people who are doing the attacks know what they're doing, basically, in which they will attack in moments in which the Palestinian people don't have internet or electricity to be able to document what, everything that's going on. And then on top of that, it's just... They do it at very key moments where people just aren't paying attention. And on top of that, they have everyone under their thumb. Like the majority of the media channels work with them in which they won't say a bad thing about Israel or the things that they're doing. So it's very mm. much social media is all that the Palestinian people have, really have, which is why I think if you care about human beings and you urge for peace and you just want peace across the world and just in general then this is definitely something you should be sharing about regardless of whether you know much about it or not innocent people are dying like every day and it makes me angry because and it makes me upset as well because I just always all the time in the back of my head I'm like I'm so lucky to have all of this and not to ever have to worry about being attacked or having to be kicked out of my home or God forbid, waking up to a bomb completely exploding my home. Like, it could happen, but for them, it's an ongoing thing. They go to sleep at night, and yeah, I just, I I can't imagine it. And that's why I I just encourage everyone to speak and share. Yeah, no, I do get you mean. Like, seeing, like, when you do see some of, like, the footage and you see, like, kids younger than yourself or younger than your siblings and, like, them having to live through it, it's, like, something that... It makes you mm-hmm. feel like sick imagining it, but also kind of like you can't really imagine it either. Yeah, I was gonna say like the thing about the the trend thing on social media. Like, I think it has become a bit of a trend to like you know speak on like controversial matters. Or, but whilst that is a bad thing, it's also I guess a good thing in case of the Palestine. Because I found out about it back in like 2011, but like I found out because of music. So there's a guy called Loki. He speaks on quite a lot of political matters and so on. So like he's always there as all. Well. Yeah, yeah. To understand it, I had to obviously go and figure out what was going on. So I just got the basic just back then. But like, and if you follow Loki over the years, he's always posted like on Twitter or whatever, like, always. you know, p- stuff happening in Palestine and anywhere that basically no one else is willing to speak on. He would consistently have done it. And that's why I was aware of it. But then I did see it once again, the recent months, like I think it, it's one of those things that right now it's kind of trendy to get yourself on the right side of some sort of like. I don't know how you say it, like, you know, like moral ground kind of like, so a lot of people have done it on that base, but I'm not sure how many people have done it, but it's really hard to tell, I guess, you know, in social media and the social media era, like how many people do it with the right intent? Like, are they trying yeah. to spread awareness or are they trying to just, you know, look good in, you know, just because, oh yeah, I'm part of movement X, Y, Z, because anyone could say that, but like, are you really deeping what you're saying? Yeah. yeah. Cause like, I remember, what's his name? Mark Ruffalo, the Hulk. Yeah. He had tweeted about it or had made something about it, and everyone was very much like, "Oh my God, thank you so much for blah, blah, blah. And then, like the next day, he was like, "Actually, I realized what I said actually isn't correct, and I was wrong, and it was just kind of like, "You weren't wrong, but everyone was just kind of like, "Oh, you probably got hmm. a phone call about something yeah. about something saying." Yeah, if you don't take it down or apologize for what you said, then X, Y, Z is going to happen. And it's just like, it's just, I don't know. I don't really pay attention to like celebrities or people who, um, or other people who have that much, I guess, fans to speak out on things. Yeah, because at the end of the day, they don't really care. I feel like people like Loki, who have been about that life and have always been speaking up about anything and everything like Akala as well he's amazing and he's always been speaking out against some um, um black lives and racism and uh everything under the book Social he's just class, always, yeah. yeah he's just always been that kind of person because 
those things matter to him and those things are important to him. So I feel like when you have celebrities who decide to like share one thing on their story and everyone just like clapping and applauding them and it's just like, oh my God, thank you so much. It's just like, why are you thanking them for doing the bare minimum? It's like, rather than thanking them, just carry on, carry on sharing awareness and carry on sharing what's happening. I mean, I guess in a way it's good because people who probably don't know anything about it have now seen it and have now and are now like looking into it and researching it but I don't know I've never really given much care or thought to celebrities talking about things when they've never cared before or they say it to just you know make sure they're on the right because for them like their reputation matters so like if they don't speak out on it they're gonna get sued if they speak out on it they get sued for them there's like this weird like crucifixion either way and yeah like there's been certain people that you've spoken about about time but once again like it's good to see that you know i assume quite a bunch of people have been educating themselves on it recently um it should be kind of see because you, know, you know see people post those you know five key things and so on like you'll see them through the feed or something yeah and it's good to see those versions of it because at least when i had tried to read up on it i swear it was not that easy to read up on like you know you can't it's very hard to understand the context just based on wikipedia and some articles because there wasn't much to go off but now because I don't like watching the gruesome videos, so I usually don't watch them. But, like, I know what to roughly expect in them. That's what I personally share. People who are actually in there and are journalists that are living within Palestine and Gaza. So I can share you guys. I actually can share some, like, actual journalists who are living within it and are speaking up about like, about Palestine to you. Because that was the best way for me to learn as well. And, like, just constantly be aware of everything that's happening. Because these people... I've literally had to make it their lives to report on it because if they don't no one will you know so there's like there's palestinian americans who speak up speak out against it and um, obviously get updates from their families who live there and then there are actual palestinian journalists who live within the gaza strip and talk about everything that's happening and take videos the ones i hate to see is when they're like just blowing up mosques like like why 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 are you raiding a mosque? What 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 is this accomplishing? Or like like this stuff? They're literally like, what's the point of running up in a gun when you know they're literally praying or something? Yeah. Well, like, what is this accomplishing? Like, it accomplishes nothing, which is why it's so pathetic. Because it's like exactly. you're attacking people who are just trying to go about their day and pray. They don't. They they're not doing anything other than peacefully praying to their Lord. Yeah, it, it doesn't make sense. They don't they don't have any justification on what they're doing either. And that's what makes it even more foul and horrific in that a lot of them I feel like that they know what they're doing is wrong, but they don't care because they've been so brainwashed and accustomed to the fact that they have to hate that they have to hate them and they have to kill them. But yeah. It's just really horrible. Yeah, another big thing is like You'll see like the big, you know, the big media news outlets, like they barely have any reports on this, even though we see so much on social media now. Yeah. For example, if you just go to the BBC website as an example, like on the news page, you barely like, you know, see like things straight away regarding Zero. it. Yeah. And th- this is the thing, like, because we've seen some videos of some politicians in the past, regardless of, I mean, a party, they've tried to call out like, you know, Israeli um, leaders, uh, leaders and so on. And these videos were just basically not in our eye or attention like but, but it was from some important conference or so on mm. but it just wasn't you know like brought to our attention and then we've seen it by social media now but this happened years ago so someone did try calling them out but instead of backing it and you know raising awareness they just kind of let it go and just let us try and like basically just kind of go on like you know headless chickens or, or just like brainwashed people just ignoring what's there the perfect example of that is what they did with jeremy corbyn like he's he's been about like he's a perfect example as well as like a British politician who's been about this life of speaking out against about Palestine and the conflict and the um war that's taking place there, and he's just always been very much. It's not it's not a difficult situation. It's it's not it's black and white. They're dying, and when he spoke out against, I think I can't remember exactly what he said, but the whole Labour Party called him anti-Semitic. And it's just like no one is being anti-Semitic, no one is being hateful towards the Jewish community, but they're just speaking awareness on the the massacre that's happening in Palestine. And I think that's where 
a lot of people are scared to talk about it too. Like you don't have to be anti-Semitic to talk out against Israel because like, just like Palestine, Israel is made up of, I'm sure, multiple religions. I'm sure there is not, there aren't just Jewish people living in Israel. Like there is in Palestine people who are Muslim, Christian, Jewish, Catholic, some who aren't even religious. They're just, just, yeah. <sighs> Do you know what, like, the rest of the world are doing anything about it? Because I, I see tweets now and then, like, from Joe Biden or, like, uh, talks about it and, like, how bad it is and all that, but I don't see anything kind of changing or improving. Or not even just America, but, like, us here or any any country, to be honest. They step in certain ways politically to avoid certain situations. It's Some of these, like, factors are just, like, for them, politically, it's better for them to just sometimes not, I guess, intervene. Like, so even if the country needs, like, that military intervention, yeah. why would they intervene and screw up themselves in terms of oil deals? That's, like, one, you know, one point of this. The only country I know of, actually, there's two, that have spoken out against Israel is Ireland and um, the Philippines. So the Philippines, historically, are known to be quite close to um, Israel and its prime minister. But... I think the thing is with the Philippines and Ireland as well is that because they have a history and their country has also gone through that whole ethnic cleansing and being becoming um, colonization. That's the word. So because Ireland and the Philippines have such a deep um, rooted history and being colonized themselves is that they recognize what's happening in Palestine. So when they see that it's happening to another country, just like South Africa, they're very much like, oh shit, yo, this is fucked up. This can't be happening. We can't we can't be sitting back and letting and let this happen all over again when we have experienced it ourselves and we have gone through it. So I think countries like that are honestly those those are the countries and the people that you need to applaud. Because it's not easy, like you said, um, Hamish, to ruin deals, any deals in general in in human beings and as horrible as that sounds that is the reality and also to note that entire area is just surrounded by conflict as well like if you look at where it is on the map you can see to the north is lebanon then there's to the north east there's syria like they're basically just surrounding conflict so they basically can't get out anywhere to any sort of like safety basically anyways and if there were troops to be you know deployed how are they going to get it through because they have to go through all these conflicts or they have to participate in fighting off on all these fronts like what what can they possibly do apart from trying to jump off on a boat and then try to you know like go towards cyprus but cyprus is always like in a in a band where they're always ready for conflict as well because of how close they are to these countries and how much risk they face from getting actually taken over by them so like for example, in Cyprus, like every man, I think once you're 18 or something, you get you have to go for mandatory military training, I think. And that's in case yeah, an actual like country takeover comes, they, they all yeah. need to just take arms and fight because it could happen any day. It could happen tomorrow. It could be happening in the next hour. It could be happening in a week. But that whole area is just like, I don't want to use the word infested, but it's literally infested with like military or like bad military presence, if that makes sense. That whole area is just surrounded with that kind of conflict, but it's just not brought to our eyes because... Also, they're not just as westernized as us, but the people that are trying to bring it out, I guess, finally help shed some light on the area. But it's worth having a read on some of the stuff happening around. Like, bear in mind that I'm no expert, and I assume none of us here are experts, but yeah, yeah. we've done some reading over time, but, I assume, too. Yeah. I never knew that that's Cyprus, so I might have, to, I might read into that as well. That's something as well that I feel like a lot of people don't seem to understand about the war that's taking place in Palestine and Israel is that Palestine don't have an army, there's no military. It's literally people with rocks. They don't have anything. Yeah, we we start we started talking about this on like how you like kind of donated books uh, to help out of there. Is there anything like you've seen online and stuff that ways we and people listening can like help out? So there's um loads of uh like I said, the best thing to do would be listen to the actual Palestinian journalists who are there and Palestinians who know what's going on and what is happening. One of my favorite people to follow is Subi Taha. He's on, he's really active on Instagram, but he follows, he updates and posts regularly about the conflict. Sorry, should not be using the term conflict because it isn't a conflict. It's ethnic cleansing that's taking place in Palestine. And um, 
there's a few. For people who don't want to use ethnic cleansing, they could use the word genocide yeah. because literally that is what it is. Yeah. Like it's it's literally being a Hitler, but just using like just saying it a different way. Like it, it's literally genocide. It's like that's what ethnic cleansing is for anyone wondering. Like it's not like yeah. That that that's another thing that I personally can't wrap my head around is that their ancestors had gone through a similar thing of what they're doing now to the Palestinian Palestinian people, and it's just like if anyone should know what it feels like to be discriminated against based on who you are and where you come from, it should be Israel. But I digress. I don't know. Yeah. So Subi Taha, he's a great um, person to follow. <laughs> but also Muhammad El Kurd as well. He is great as well. He he recently did an interview, I think, with ABC News, in which a journalist was asking him some very biased questions about how does he not like feel really insensitive questions actually about how does he not feel embarrassed about the fact that Palestine is fighting back and X Y Z and he was just kind of like. Are you not embarrassed about the fact of how many people have died and been killed and been murdered? And the journalists were just kind of like, um, I'm going to end the interview here because I have nothing to say. And it's just like, because it's true. It, yeah. He's posted it on his, um, his Instagram as well. But th- those two are definitely people that I would encourage people to follow if they really want to see what's actually happening. Yeah. But like, Harmish doesn't like watching the gruesome videos. I will say, I will warn you that there are some, there is some gruesome content. So trigger warning. Yeah. Also, thankfully, Instagram does like put that censor above it. Yeah. So if you're accidentally scrolling through a story, you can just skip over it because that's why I do. Thanks for that. Yeah. Yeah. We'll get you to um. Yeah. Send us those Instagram usernames so we can like add it to the add it to the show notes. Yeah. What I was gonna say was I don't want to use this as an actual example, but. I'm only using it because I'm, I'm sure a lot of people have seen the TV series Messiah and the conflict that is briefly like shed on or like shown in that TV show. Imagine that on a worse scale, hap- like but happening so much. Basically, it's on a worse scale that when they're moving, because I don't want to spoil the TV show as well, but it's based in, in and around the area of the conflict as well. So like, oh, was that, that, that is guy? like one thing that, looks really creepy. that is Connor is with the miracle oh, guy. Okay, yeah, or, yeah. Or if you it's like picture. Jesus yeah, yeah. kind of is here 21st <laughs> century kind of thing. Because, like, it's in and around the conflict that he, you know, like, got that following from in, in this show. But, like, there's he sh- there's, it sheds a little light on it, but I guess people probably didn't, you know, like, pay too much attention to it. Like, how, because no- they made it look so normalized. Oh, a bomb just went off there and now we're going to try, you know, migrate or just take refuge elsewhere. But, like, that's happening, like, on a way worse scale. It's kind of a one way to think about it. If you've seen Messiah. I haven't seen Messiah, so. I'm trying to find out when season two comes out. That was a good TV show, I won't lie. Aaron, do you think it's. No, wait, Connor is or do you think he's divine? I just like to believe the best in people, so <laughs> I, 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 I believe he's, he's the Holy Christ, man. Oh, no, it's been cancelled. Wait, what? Yeah, Netflix has cancelled Messiah after one season following anti-Islamic accusations. Guess I'll never know now. Oh, my goodness. Oh, that sucks. For fuck's sake. I've never seen it, so I can't say. Cool, yeah. Did, did you have any kind of, like, any any final stuff on that? No, I guess the final thing I just wanted to say is that if you feel as though you're not educated enough then definitely google is free google is there there's always something there's always books and infographics to read as well and there's always um there's a march taking place next week at london in london again on the 12th of june if you want to have like a open dialogue about it and find out more about the ethnic cleansing and genocide then definitely come down i'll be there again so Anyone wants to come this hang. this will be out after after the twelfth oh, of June. Well. Yeah. <laughs> Just, um, but but well, if, nice if you were there, you there. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we could switch topics a little bit here. Are, are you a foodie? Because your Instagram is full of food. I love food. I mean, who isn't a foodie? I feel like if you're not a foodie, you're a bit. Well, I don't know if I can trust you. <laughs> because basically, I I don't think I'm like a super foodie, but I think I'm a foodie enough that it makes my decisions on where I want to go to eat and what I want to eat, if that makes sense. But but everyone calls me fu- everyone calls me fussy as a result of that. I don't think you so have to post about food all the time to be considered a foodie. I think if you just... Yeah, what, what is a foodie? How do you become a foodie? I mean, my the way I define a foodie is just someone who loves to eat and loves to cook. I don't think... I think the social media 
term for foodie is someone who is like a food blogger, but I've never really hmm. known. I think it is just like someone who's a food blogger. I, I think that they can just find distinct like taste in in like me, like a variety of cuisines and know what they like specifically. I may not have everything for it, but they may have a specific. They know how to pick out a specific things for them, yeah. and maybe will help their friends pick out a specific thing based on what they like. That's what that's what I kind of define it. Okay. No, I just, obviously you and your. I feel like you've just like described yourself, Hamish, and said like <laughs> that's that's a beauty. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, because I'd say like yeah, surely everyone, like ninety percent of the world, likes food or loves food. Maybe not everyone likes to cook, but yeah. I mean, um, I've known friends who don't really care about food. That's our room. <laughs> they'll, they'll just eat. Wait, As in, no, I care about food, but care. I'm not like... No, I'd say like, it's, I don't care necessarily like... Like, I don't care about what restaurant we go to because I'm kind of like, I wouldn't mind trying somewhere new or like going somewhere I've previously been. Yeah. Like, I'll try something new. That's fine. But I would say I, I like food. I like care about food because, you know, kind of... Even if it's literally like, I need food to survive. Like, yeah, yeah. I, I have to kind of care about it. But it's not like, I don't like have that kind of, uh, oh, there's too much salt in my food. Do you know what I mean? Uh, like, that's something I hear a lot. And I'm like, I'm not, I'm not like that. Like, hmm. actually, I, I think I qualify as a traditional foodie because I have a, <laughs> like a burger Instagram highlight. Oh yeah, there you go. <laughs> so I might, I, I might qualify, you know, to the traditional foodie. You know what? Recently, I've been really craving a GBK burger, but they don't deliver it to me here. So I need to go to a GBK. I don't know why. I've just been craving the GBK gourmet burger for some reason, and I just need to have it. GBK is great, so I don't blame you. Wait, GBK or Nando's? I'm curious. GBK. I can't stand Nando's. I'm not a fan. Yeah, can't stand fan. it. If I go Nando's, I don't have chicken. I have the beanie wrap. I think Hamish, you used to have that, you used to have that a bit, didn't you? Well, right now, well, because they kept changing so much. There used to be an OG veggie wrap, which used to be lit. Mm. And now the only good... Op- they used to be super green. Well, super green's still there, but the imitator is just way better than the super green, in my opinion. I had the imitator uh, the other day because there was nowhere else to eat. But I, did, I ordered the beanie wrap, and my sister ordered the imitator. And I tasted it, and I didn't like it. Are you veg, by the way? No, no, no I'm not veg. I eat, I eat meat. Oh, okay. like I, yeah, I love meat, but... I just don't like Nando's. I, I don't know. I've oh. had their chicken before. Like It depends on, I guess, the restaurant. I, there's a big difference in between the the chain, you know, like the restaurant chains for some reason in Nando's. I don't know why. Yeah. Did you just get an email the other day from Nando's about like Take bringing you your up. nan yeah. or granddad into uh, Nando's and they get, to, what is it, they get to eat for free? Or is it's it they 50% get off your whole, like entire okay, thing. Okay, that's cute. <laughs> yeah. I was, do you know what? The first thing I thought after that when I got that email was like, what if I made like a website like rent a nan and like people could like rent an old person temporarily like rent rent an old person yeah, but that like could mean day. rent a nanny as in for your kid you mug so you need to think that through a bit more like rent a grandma then i don't know <laughs> 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 or just rent rent an elderly well, person. but rent a nan a nice ring to it you know yeah it does it does actually i might check the domain for that now <laughs> but you, you when when this episode comes out maybe maybe i'll shout out i don't know who knows <laughs> no there's probably like a lot of legal stuff involved in that I think we got a game called Categories, where you have to name as many uh, things of a certain category within 30 seconds, and then you compete against like one of us. Okay, Hamish, do you want to go, or as in, do you want to compete? Or? Yeah, I want to compete. <laughs> yes, I want to come as close to winning as possible. So, okay, for the first official category, let's go with food chains. Let's do food chains. Food chains, okay. Yeah, so let's go Hamish first. How many do you think you can name in 30 seconds? I'm going to start with five. Lerp? I think I can do ten. Ten, okay. Hamish? Uh, um, let's just go fifteen. Bullshit. Oh, bullshit. Cool bullshit. Okay, <laughs> Hamish. Fifteen food chains. We may need to check, but hopefully we won't. All right, cool. Okay, I'll count you down, yeah? Yep. Three, two, one, go. McDonald's, KFC, Chicken Cottage, Select Chicken, Sam's, Wally's, Banana Tree, Nobu, <laughs> oh, um, wet Wendy's, Chick Fil A. Oh shit! Five more. <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> you you got ten. You got ten. I just got stuck. I was going for chicken brands, and I just stopped. And one one, I switched to one random one, and then I couldn't go back to it. I couldn't like finish what was in my head. But yeah, you got a point there. Yeah, you did like chicken cottage select chicken. I don't know what else you did. McDonald's KFC. Stuff, Sam's. Burger King, oh yes, yeah. oh, I should not have gone away from. Yeah, I should have just went King to a random like is... no brew. That, that's what's fucked me up. I couldn't go back. She was starting. Yeah. And then you started going American ones. I was like, what? <laughs> GB, we just talked <laughs> about Nando's. GPK. Oh, Nando's, oh my yeah. days. Honest. Honestly, like, oh, this game here, yeah, like I know okay. people listening won't ever get it, but this game is fucking tough. Yeah. <laughs> you have to understand. Okay, let's just do names of movies. Let's let's see how we can do that. So, like Lareb, how many do you think you can name? Thirty seconds. You can name ten. Twelve. Wow. Lareb. 13. <laughs> and you can I clarify one thing? Does it count like chain? So you know when there's like a movie, it goes one, two, three. Does that count? Or you we're just... not going to count it for this. I, I've now said we're not going to. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I'm just going to go 14. Is that right? Um, it's one every two seconds. Can you do it? Believe in yourself. Come on. There's... Go for 20. Go on. Let's go for 20. And do it. 20? Oh, so <laughs> She's contemplating doing 15. <laughs> I remember, don't, don't get in the middle. I'm just. I'm just shit do you 15, Yeah, 15. Hamish? You know what? I'll let you go for that. Though I feel like you'll do that. I should have just went for a high number. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll let you go for 15. I'm calling bullshit. Okay. Okay, Lareb. Can I count down? Any genre, right? Any genre. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any genre. Three, two, one, go. Harry Potter, Twilight, Fish Tank, Lord of the Rings, Kabibushi Kabigam, Hasi Uh, Ron Lila, um, uh, John Wick, Cruella de Vil, Lion King, Finding Nemo, Shark Tale, The Incredibles, Finding Dory, and... Oh my god! Aladdin! <laughs> <laughs> Why'd you just go all, like, Disney? <laughs> I don't know. Wait, wait, I have a question. Does, does Finding Dory not count as, like, a thing to Finding Nemo? No, because Finding Dory is about Finding Dory. Yeah, it's not like Toy Story 1, Toy Story 2, Toy Story 3, oh, or like Incredibles 1, 2. I could sneak away the point. I yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, no, no, you got that, you got that. I'm going to go for... Let me do uh, Capital Cities. Hamish, how many Capital Cities can you name in 30 seconds? Five. Five. Okay, Lareb? Six. <laughs> Hamish? Oh, we're really going for low, aren't we? I'm going to go ten. Lareb? Bullshit. Okay, ten. I'll, ba- I'll back you to do this, Hamish. I had to think about what okay. Capital City was. <laughs> <laughs> ten, ten Capital Cities in 30 seconds. Right. Okay, okay, Hamish. I'm actually rooting for you. Three, two, one, go. London, Dublin, Delhi, Moscow, Washington, or New York, which I want it is. Sao Paulo. Oh no! Wait, not Sao Paulo. I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's, it's not Sao Paulo. It's Sao Paulo, and it's, Sao that's not even comes to city either. <laughs> my my brain is just like Paris, <laughs> Madrid. I'm so far off. Oh mate, it's, it's got seven. Seven. It's, yeah. It's a shambles. There. Oh, I thought you could have done that. I think Lareb's like three. Not. I thought I could too. I don't think Washington yeah, in thirty seconds or New York counts. Oh, come on. <laughs> Guys, I didn't get 10 New York. No, no, because because you said all New York, New York, I wasn't going to give that to you anyway. You can't just be like, it's one of them. Do you know what I mean? Wait, if I said, if I said them as individual cities, then what are you going to do? One of them counts as capital, one of them doesn't. Either way, it's L. Let's go for an easy one. Let's just do colours. Hmm. Oh. Okay. How many colours, Lareb, can you name in 30 seconds? In 30 seconds, I think I can do 12. Hamish? <laughs> 13. Lareb? 15. 15. You said 15. Yeah, go for it. Go for it. I need, I need to scavenge a point. Okay, 15 colours in 30 seconds. 3, 2, 1, okay. go. Black, grey, white, purple, green, red, blue, orange, yellow, green. I think you said green. Brown. Did I say green? I thought I said grey. Oh, well, you might have. I don't know. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Oh. Gold, silver, cream. You said black. Um, I said white. Turquoise. Done. Aqua. Oh, I'm done. 
Yeah. You don't even know how many I did. You did like Carefully, 13. Does count? <laughs> does turquoise not, why does turquoise not count? Because she said it after. The oh, yeah, I said it after. I, said I, was, I, was, I gave you some leeway because you like stopped there. But yeah, you, you almost got it. But we need to give Hamish a point anyway. So, so we'll, we'll, we'll let him have it. <laughs> that's, I, that's, I didn't want to interrupt. Yeah. I did. <laughs> Let's go with uh, clothing brands. Oh, shit. I'm fucked. Okay. Hamish, how many clothing brands? Can you name it 30 seconds? And I'll say they're, they're a clothing brand if, like, we went on their website now. Like, does Asda count? No, you have to say, like, George. Okay. Isn't that the, the brand that Asda does? George, is that it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, like, if you went on their website, yeah. they'd have, like, okay. clothing. Like, you'd buy clothing. Okay, cool. Hamish, would you say five? Yep. Seven. Hamish? Ten. Ten. <sighs> ten, ten, ten. Lareb? Eleven. <laughs> <laughs> hey. <laughs> 12 12 Lareb 13 Hamish uh, 14 why not 14 okay Lareb go for it okay she's called I'm bullshit so <laughs> wait just say 14 14 clothing yeah. brands okay uh, uh, Hamish mm-hmm. 3 2 1 go Nike Sundico Adidas Fila Puma <laughs> Dio, do Dio, LV, um, Versace, it's Lazender, Lonsdale, Umbro, George, River Island, H and M. Fourteen. You got fourteen. <laughs> Wait, did you say fourteen or fifteen? 14, 14. I don't, I wasn't counting, I wasn't counting. Yeah, no, I mean, did you say that you oh, got yeah. 14? Did you say that you like, you were targeting 14? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 14. Okay, okay, you so you the got the point. point. Wait, so I got it? Yeah. Yeah, 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 you got it, just in time. Like, zero, like, just in time. Okay, let's, let's go with music genres. So, Hamish, how many do you think you can name in 30 seconds? 10. 15. 15. Hamish? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm not, I'm not on that small Fifteen is <laughs> actually a bit mad, you know. Okay. Larev, 15 music genres yeah. in 30 seconds. If you get this, you win the game. If you don't get this, it's a tiebreaker. <laughs> yeah. Three, two, one, go. Pop, J-pop, K-pop, UK, dubstep, hip-hop, reggae, metal, rock. Um, dub, dub and bass? What is it? Oh, it's the wrong one. I guess that's that. Um, smooth, no, smoothie, but I don't know if you get. Desi. Desi, yeah. Musicals. Uh, time's yeah. up. Yeah, you, you got like 11. 11? You went, you went too high, Laura. You went too high. Damn. Yeah. I thought you were going to go like Desi, like Desi Pop and all that stuff, you know, like. Damn. Okay, let's, this, this is a bit of a, let's, let's see if you think you, this is like a possible one. Cause as we t- we talked about it at the beginning, beginning of the episode, mm. job titles. <laughs> okay. But like, it can't be like creative, executive, like it has to be kind of like, you know, ones we'd agree on are like a. Oh God. A normal job title. So, Hamish, how many do you think you can name in 30 seconds? 15. 15? What? <laughs> <laughs> Why'd you start so high, man? I, Stakes are high. I call bullshit. Go for it. <laughs> One every two seconds. Yeah. Okay. Bullshit. Job titles, okay. And they have to be like, we kind of have to agree. Verify. At least one of us has to be like, yeah. VAR checks, yeah, yeah, okay. That's it. Okay. So keep going, even if you think you've named 15, just in yeah, case, okay, yeah. maybe. Just see how many can do within 30 seconds. Okay, three, two, one, go. Software engineer, project manager, product owner, front-end developer, back-end developer, producer, director, CEO, COO, CIO, CTO. <laughs> um, shit, that, that threw me off. Assistant, personal assistant, police officer, accountant, solicitor. Tie run up. You, you did fine. fourteen. Solicitor. You did fourteen. 
Wait, wait, wait is that included? That's not included solicitor. <laughs> I what, don't what is... include assistant or personal assistant either because it's the same thing. Oh, I only counted personal assistant. Oh, okay, cool. I, oh, I didn't cool. count assistant. <laughs> what's C? What's C? You said CIO. Yeah, what's yeah. that? CEO, CIO, and CT. Uh, yeah, yeah like CTO. That. But what's yeah. CIO? I haven't. I don't know if I've heard that. I I know I definitely heard it once. Like, once again, I didn't make, I didn't pull this out of my ass. Chief Information Officer. That's such a random one, but <laughs> no, it even says job title. Yeah, no, fair enough. But no, sorry, Hamish. Oh. One short. So Woo. Laura played a smart game and called bullshit. I don't. I don't know what that was. Four three. Four three. Yeah. Uh, that was, that was the thing was, yeah, you know what I recently found out? Apparently, Aaron, we're not professionals. <laughs> Basically, yeah. <laughs> what do you mean? I was told, yeah. As in for I the podcast. Told you that. No, like in general, like professionals, even as um software engineers or so on. Because yeah, basically to be a, to count as a professional, you have to be a doctor, accountant, solicitor, or one of those uh, kind of. Okay. We apparently don't count as a fucking professional, so all the the degree, the certification is all it's all for bullshit. Aaron. Just thought I'd let you know. So, like, so I, I think I, I think that that does ring a bell. What you just said. I thought I was professional to the to, to But then what are we? Just amateurs. I don't you know. Okay. <laughs> R- rookies, rookies. <laughs> okay, but yeah, cool. We're um, coming up to the end of the episode. Covered, covered quite a bit. So, Lareb, how we end it off is like some final questions, call out, and a shout out. So, we will start off with the final questions. First one for you is, what's next for you? Yes, for me right now, what's next is finding a new job. So, um, looking for opportunities within development for TV and film, and yeah, just staying positive. And taking each day as it goes, I realised that I'm only t- I'm literally only 25, and I put so much pressure on myself to have everything under control, and um, I don't think I need to do that. I feel like I'm allowed to kind of breathe and take things as they come. So at the moment, I don't know, but I'm also just staying hopeful and keeping my fingers crossed. The second question is, what is one song or album you'd like to listen to forever? Joe Hisashi's Spirited Away. Oh, the orchestra and the music and the harmony. And sorry, not the harmony, the piano. I can listen to it on loop forever and ever and ever and ever. It's beautiful. And it just makes you go through every emotion. So I feel like it would be the perfect song to listen to every day, forever. <laughs> because it would suit to a stroll in the park. To um, to getting married, to just celebrating graduation or whatever, would be perfect. Nice. Last question. This is a question we actually ask every guest, and that is, what has been your most memorable third wheeling experience? And we don't mean like on this podcast. We mean like real life, real life shit. Oh, I guess my most memorable third wheel was uh, when I had to work in a team of five for a full year that's that's been one of my most memorable third wheel moment when i became president of the university of westminster and for a year i was the pres of the uni and for a whole year i just worked with these five incredible individuals who became like brother and sister to me and that was probably one of my most memorable moments because we went through everything together and um a lot of trials and tribulations and yeah they yeah i'm still really close to them all and i love them to bit so that was probably one of my most memorable because we got a lot of shit done and we changed a lot of stuff within the university so yeah did you say you became president of the university of westminster yeah i was the supply call president of westminster for from 2018 to 2019 Oh shit, that's that's big. We we, we, we could have talked about that. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. No, sorry, I don't really talk no, about it. I don't really um bring it up. Yeah, but it's quite a big thing, not to like, yeah, not to mention yeah, or like not to bring up. <laughs> I'd be flexing it all the time, you know. That that'd be my LinkedIn it was, title. It was <laughs> thinking about it now. It was actually kind of a big deal because I was the first CMP student as well to become the president because um the first art student as well to be the president because obviously you had sabbatical officers and vice presidents of different campuses within Westminster. But I was the first Harrow student, which is an art student, to become pres. So, yeah, I guess it is kind of cool. <laughs> Sweet. The, the next topic is 
oh sorry the next section is a call out or nomination Aww. and yeah you could basically nominate one of many people to hopefully be a guest in the future i have so many people i would love to have on this but i have to uh, i have to call out one specific person because oh no no it's one of many so oh, you could go many okay kevin morosky tom dunn lucia fantini adam james Coro Lopez, Isabel Laidlaw, who else do I have? Barrington, Paul Robinson, my <laughs> film teacher, who would be great to have on this. I have so many more, but no one else. Can. My auntie, Aisha, she is like... Is that the one who cake crashed um, like halfway through? Yeah, the one that just gave <laughs> She, special shout out to her because even um, when I was going through the change of like subject and stuff, she was always she was always there and supporting me and root, and rooting for me and always telling me to not give up because uh yeah she just wanted me to kind of do what it is I wanted to do and it really encouraged me to not give up on my dreams so major shout out to her she's like yeah. one of my she's like a best friend I don't consider her an auntie you know yeah she's family that's really nice bestie. yeah no that's really nice more more people you mentioned the the easier the berries for us <laughs> kind of helps helps us out. So appreciate that. And yeah, last bit of shout out. So kind of anything you kind of want to plug, promote, mention, just yeah, shout out, like can it be anything? Yeah, f- floor's, floor's yours. I'd really like to promote my two friends, Kevin Morosky and Tom Dunn, who currently um, have decided to leave their big, big corporate jobs and actually make, basically create a TV series that they've been thinking and working on for a really long time. And um they had a crowdfunder go live a couple months ago and they reached their crowdfunder and I think they've just finished shooting as well. So I, I really want to shout them out and hopefully when it goes live, people go and watch it. I'll, I'll give you their ads and the page of their show as well so you guys can like plug it and stuff. But if I have to shout something out, it would be that. I'm really excited. No, it sounds really cool. Hamish? Yeah, so I'm going to shout out two albums on a podcast. So the two albums are going to be from Loki, Soundtrack to The Struggle 1 and Soundtrack to The Struggle 2. Highly recommend them. Soundtrack to The Struggle 1 was one of my favorite albums. So I definitely recommend it. And you'll hear references to conflicts such as Palestine throughout anyways. And the podcast is going to be back for Norshal.live. She's finally decided to get back on the podcast grind. And as she's part of the gang, she gets a shout out. So yeah, go check it out. Awesome. I'm going to watch her shout out. I'm 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 going to shout out my referral code to um a website called Hired. It's like for people looking for a job in a in like tech. If if you use my referral code and you get a job, I get a thousand pounds. So uh, yeah, go <laughs> no go <way>. use that. <laughs> yeah, but, Aaron will split that with yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, honestly, if if you message me saying if I get an email saying I got a thousand pounds because you got a job in it, I'll I'll give you half of it. It's fine. Uh. So five hundred pound each. That's that's good. Good deal. I th- I say and if you, if you're lucky, I'll give you more. But probably not. Let's see. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Go, go check that out if you're if 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 you're looking for anything like involved in tech. I think product management and design, but mainly yeah, tech related. But yeah, awesome. Thank thanks, Lara, for coming on. Thank you so much for having me, Bill. No, no, it's been really good. Yeah, nice meeting you as well. Thank you, Bill. It's been fun. Great. And yeah, hope everyone else enjoyed listening, enjoyed the episode, and yeah, we'll catch you next week. A bit. I'm gonna do it. Right. Bye. 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 The studio's my second home. That's why I have it in my bedroom. I really do this all on my own. The shark quarry and my brother home. And he was here from the day one. And not gonna lie, he's a real one. In my team, there are no fake ones. It's a fake love. No, I don't want.